morning and welcome. As you can tell, I am not Pastor Mitch. She is away today, so here I am, Pastor Nick, back with you again. It's good to be here. Last time I was here, I believe, was on All Saints Sunday, back in November. Time sure flies when you're either having fun or you're in lockdown with a stay-at-home order. But it's good to be here, back in this beautiful sanctuary on a nice, bright, sunny day. And I look forward to uh, leading worship here today, to worshiping with you, to bringing you a message from the Word of God, and just uh, to spending this time together. So thank you for being with us, thank you for joining us, and come back again next week. We'll be right here, same time and same place. We begin with some announcements. Uh, the announcement that I do have is that on Ash Wednesday, which is Wednesday, February 17th, there will be worship at 6 p.m., and the plan is to live stream that. And Lent, as we know, begins on Ash Wednesday with the imposition of ashes on our foreheads. This is a sign of our sorrow and repentance for our sins, as well as of our, our, as well as of our frailty. For dust we came, to dust we shall return. But the good news is that the ashes are in the shape of the cross, the same cross that was marked on our foreheads, at baptism again reminds us that we belong to Christ through Christ our sins are forgiven and we have the promise of eternal life this year as I say we will be live streaming our Ash Wednesday service on February 17th at 6 o'clock in the evening to prepare you may pick up ashes and instructions at the church on Wednesday February 10th or Thursday February 11th from 9 a.m to 1 p.m. Please ring the bell at the front gate or you can also pick them up on Saturday, February 13th from 9 to noon. Please go to the back door of the parish hall next to the handicapped parking. Uh, look forward to celebrating Ash Wednesday with you all as we begin our Lenten journey toward Easter and toward the good news that the resurrection has already happened. Resurrection to eternal life. And so that's it for our announcements, and we move forward with our worship this morning with our call to mission. We are here to receive Christ. We are called to proclaim Christ, and we are sent to show Christ. We continue with our thanksgiving for baptism, and blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our life, and our salvation. Amen. Joined with Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people, Israel, from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son John was your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your Spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
continue as we worship with prayer and with praise. For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, reading verses 21 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in? Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? Who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name? Because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here ends our first lesson. Our psalm today is Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11 and verse 20, part C. Hallelujah! How good it is to sing praises to our God! How pleasant it is to honor God with praise! The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem and gathers the exiles of Israel. The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Lord counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to God's wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music upon the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth, making grass to grow upon the mountains. God provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they cry. God is not impressed by the might of a horse and has no pleasure in the speed of a runner, but finds pleasure in those who fear the Lord and those who await God's steadfast love. Hallelujah. Our second lesson this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading verses 16 through 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, 
for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some, if I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. Here ends our second lesson today. At this moment in time, we will continue with our prayer requests for today. Lord of all in need, search out all who cry to you in distress. Scatter the heavy clouds of depression, chronic, chronic illness, unemployment and loneliness with your radiant light. Send us as encouragement and signs of your healing. Please pray for Bob, Al, Michaela, Sophia, Ken, Virginia, Don, Art, Jackie, Cecilia, Richard and Vicky, Ethel, Liam, Doris, Myrtle, Maria, Paul, Karen, Don, Tyler, Tom, Carol, Dolly, Ian, Kristen, Shirley, Pat, Connor and family, Pamela, Susan, Neil, Deirdre, John and Colleen, Alyssa, Albert, Lisa, John, Sammy, Judy, Gina and her mom, Melissa, Jeffrey, Claudette, Jose, Samantha, and finally Ginny. We pray for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. Please bring comfort, help, and healing to us in all phases of our changed lives. We remember today those who are most vulnerable to the disease, those who are ca caring for the sick and their families, those who are struggling with job and financial issues, those who feel isolated, those who have been hit hard, and those who are pretty much unscathed. Be with us all, Lord, to help us to care for one another in our nation and in our world. Give your church unity. Inspire all the baptised with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful 
and where it struggles. Shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. We remember all those who risk their lives for others in the line of duty. And we ask that you bless them and their families as they serve to protect and help us. We pray for Mount Cross Ministries. We thank you for the way the summer camping program there has ministered to our young people in the past. And we look forward to the time when camp is once again a reality for our youth. We pray for our church, Lord, and for your guidance in all aspects of our ministry, for Elizabeth Eaton, presiding bishop of the ELCA, for Mark Holmerud, bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod, and the Synod staff, and for Bethel Lutheran Church, for Pastor Mitch, our church council and BLCW board, our church staff members, our path toward meeting again in person, and the people of Bethel as we worship and serve together. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign for ever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
So it was this very Sunday a year ago, and I don't mean Super Bowl Sunday, no. It was 52 weeks ago today, this Sunday, that I led worship here at Bethel for the first time in 2020. That year we would all like to forget. But a year ago, the Super Bowl was played on February 2nd on Groundhog Day, and I was looking forward to baseball's spring training beginning in the coming week after this Sunday. The coronavirus and COVID-19 was a story in the news at that time. It was an important story, but it wasn't the important story. There were just a handful of cases in the U.S., and then and all of them were thought to be travel-related. Life for us, it was normal. Remember normal? And even though the 49ers had lost the Super Bowl, things were generally okay. We had no idea, though, what lay ahead of us. So I look back on that time a year ago, it obviously seems to be better to me because I'm looking at it through the lens of the past 12 months. 12 months of shutdowns, and the horrific news of people getting COVID and dying of COVID. And looking through that lens, I remember that Sunday, February 9, 2020, as a good day, during a good time. And looking back to a good day at a good time is one of the themes of the movie A Christmas Story. You know, A Christmas Story about the boy who wants a BB gun for Christmas. Well, in that movie, Christmas Day comes, and he gets his coveted present. And after the gift-opening frenzy is finished, and the father is settled into his comfortable chair reading his funny pages in the newspaper, the narrator issues us all a reality check. He says, sometimes life is like that. Sometimes at the height of our revelries, when our joy is at its zenith, when all is most right with the world, the most unthinkable disasters descend upon us. And that is the moment when the neighbor's hounds invade the house and make off with the family's turkey, their Christmas dinner. So let me be honest, looking through that lens of the past 12 months, no matter how much all seemed right with the world, it really wasn't 12 months ago. There was a presidential impeachment trial in progress. The coronavirus was having an impact on financial markets, on the economy, and airlines were beginning to implement travel restrictions because of the virus. As of February 9, 2020, just over 800 people worldwide had died of COVID-19. And the bad news was about to get worse, much worse. Well, you know, maybe that Sunday a year ago really was good day. Maybe it wasn't. Nonetheless, an unthinkable disaster, a global pandemic, really was about to descend upon us. Reading today's gospel text, I wonder if those afflicted in, in this reading, the sick, or those thought to be possessed by demons, I wonder if they look back on the days before their own unthinkable disasters had descended upon them, they looked back, back upon those days as good days. Whether or not they had a nostalgic fondness for the days before they became afflicted. Take Simon's mother-in-law, for instance. We have no idea what her life was really like before she developed her fever, but it was probably a difficult and a fairly limited life, given what life was like at that time in that place. Women. They were essentially treated like property, belonging to a man, either her father or her husband. So try to imagine what life was like for Simon and Andrew's mother-in-law. Simon's mother-in-law. A life of hard work, a life of serving others. She was most likely married before she was 15 years old. We know she gave birth to at least one daughter, and she saw that daughter married off to Simon, a fisherman. But she herself had almost no opportunity to improve her economic situation. She was entirely dependent upon her husband for food, for housing, and for whatever sense of security she felt. 
And now, in our own time, many people become curious about her when they read about this encounter with Jesus and his healing of her. When the fever leaves her, we are told, her first response to being healed, to being restored to herself, is to arise and serve her guests, taking absolutely no time for herself to recuperate, to recover, to rest. Instead, she gets up immediately and begins serving her guests. That response to immediately give, get up and serve, it always evokes curiosity when I'm with people discussing this gospel reading. Viewed through our own cultural lens, that response seems somewhat demeaning or degrading, almost dehumanizing for her. But on the other hand, what if it's none of that? What if her recollection of the time before this unthinkable disaster of a fever descended upon her? What if that re recollection was a recollection of her finding joy in serving others? Several years ago, the author Gary Chapman wrote a book in which he defined five love languages, five ways people have of expressing their loves for other, their love for others. Acts of service is one of those languages. It's fairly easy to look up the other four, so I'm going to leave that to you if you wish to do so. So what if, in fact, Simon's mother-in-law experienced acts of service as her love language, language, as her way of finding and giving meaning to her life? If that was the case, then Jesus healing her from the fever freed her, freed her to resume healing, resume practicing her love language, freed her for expressing that love language in service to others. Perhaps serving others brought her joy, pure joy, and her encounter with her healing by Jesus restored that joy to her. And we can envision the news of her healing spreading throughout that city, throughout Capernaum. Last Sunday we learned that Jesus, we learned immediately before Jesus and the other came to Simon's house, they had been in the synagogue where Jesus had taught and had also driven out a demon from a man. The news of those events in that synagogue, as I say, they spread throughout the city. The news of Jesus healing the sick, of restoring for many what was considered to be normal, of a return to the good old days of their memories. That news spread, we're told that the whole population of Capernaum, perhaps as many as 1,500 people, surround Simon's house. Well, most likely it's far fewer. And included among those gathered were the sick and those thought to be possessed, all hoping Jesus would heal them, free them from their illnesses, from disease, and from what at the time was considered demonic possession. Perhaps it was epilepsy, perhaps it was mental illness, perhaps it was both. Regardless, they hoped Jesus would free them and return them to their normal life experiences. When Jesus freed Simon's mother-in-law from her fever, he freed her to resume expressing herself through her love language, through service. So we have to ask ourselves, what were all those others in that crowd around Simon's house? Those whom Jesus freed that evening from their afflictions, what were they freed for? What were they freed to do? Imagine yourself in that crowd outside Simon's house so very long ago. You brought your sick father, your mother, your sibling, a child, a spouse, or whomever, because you hope Jesus can heal them, can free them from their affliction. And that's exactly what Jesus does for them. And so you have to ask, now what? What's next? After days, after weeks, perhaps after months or years of living and caring for an ailing loved one, that loved one is now healed, now cured, now normal. What does that do for the community, for the family? It restores it. It heals it. It frees it from the burden of illness, of affliction, and it restores those who are afflicted to community. It frees both the patient and the caregivers from the stress of the affliction. It brings joy. It gives new life. And that's what Jesus did for all of them. So no wonder everyone is searching for Jesus when he tries to get away to a deserted place to pray. Hearing what he had done for others, everyone wanted Jesus to rescue them from the unthinkable disasters which had descended upon them. 
just like all those in the crowd outside the house the day before because of the hope that Jesus gives, the hope that Jesus brings. Now, that crowd outside of Simon's house, it isn't strictly or literally limited to that time and that place so long ago. Throughout history, people have figuratively gathered around Simon's house because of the hope Jesus gives, the experience and the promise of healing that he brings. Even today, even us, we stand in that crowd along with all those who have been descended upon by this current unthinkable disaster. A global pandemic? Really? I never would have thought such a thing possible in my lifetime. And so I stand in and with that crowd, hoping Jesus will free me from it, even as I await my turn for the vaccine and the freedom that that will bring. Freedom from this pandemic, from the isolation, from the separation. Free for me to return to where we were a year ago on this Sunday. Free to once again gather, to worship. A year ago we were oblivious, oblivious to and unaware of what lay ahead of us, the inconvenience, the suffering, and the tremendous death this virus has brought us. But even as we all stand together in that crowd and wait for Jesus to free us from this current unthinkable disaster, we can remember Jesus already has freed us. Freed us in our baptism from the power of sin and death by his life among us, by his death on the cross and his resurrection. In freeing us from those things, Jesus has also freed us from other things. He's freed us for other things. Freed us to do other things. Things like expressing the Christian love language of service to others. And we should notice at the very end of this reading today, when the disciples find Jesus in that deserted place, when they say to him, everyone is searching for you, Jesus doesn't say to them, let me go to the neighboring towns. He says, let us go. And that is something really important Jesus frees us for, to grow with others and to grow closer to him on this journey we call life. In this crowd, as we wait for this unthinkable disaster, this pandemic descended upon us to lift. Jesus frees us to care about others, to show love for others in acts of service to others. And during this pandemic, we can do that by practicing what we've heard over and over for the past year. Stay six feet apart, wear your mask, wash your hands frequently, and avoid gatherings. And if we do that, normal, those good old days we long for, they will return. We will be able to gather once again in sanctuaries like this for worship. We will be able to sing together, to pray together, to recite liturgy together, to be together, united physically in the body of Christ, although we have always been knit together into the body of Christ through the mystery of the communion of saints. Jesus has freed us from the disaster of sin and its consequences, and he's also freed us to practice God's will for our lives, which is to love one another, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Amen. Now let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive this blessing. God the Creator strengthen you, Jesus the Beloved fill you, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God.